I will use velocity much more often in, as in the dynamics case, you will see. So this, this is a preferred way for me, okay? We talked about it this in the previous segment. Liquids, if I give you a mass, and there will be a specific volume it will constrain, okay? If I have a one liter of engine oil, okay? I can really try to squeeze and put it into a half a liter volume of a container. I can't really do that because one quartz, that is it. I cannot squeeze it any further, okay? So this means that density is constant for liquids, okay? However, for the gases, then what happens is if I have a mass, there's not just a volume. I can have very different range of volumes, okay, that I can occupy depending on my pressure, depending on my temperature, okay. So, and density is variable for gases. So, this is an important one that I would like you to know, okay. The next I want to cover is specific weight. You may have heard this, you may not heard about it, that's quite alright. If you feel everything is new to you, that's okay. That's why you're here to learn, right? I'm okay with that. The letter is gamma, the Greek letter gamma. Okay, there's not much fancy going on over here. What's happening is I have a gamma, which is a specific weight, is equal to density times the gravity. So this is the acceleration due to gravity if I'm using myself SI units then I will get myself 9.81 meter per second square right if I'm using British gravitational this value will be 32.2 .2 feet per second square right and the density is whatever is the density of the particular substance that I'm dealing with so you can see here and this acceleration is due to gravity can change obviously it's a function of altitude but as mechanical engineers that doesn't really happen too often for our applications that's more like aerospace engineers maybe okay but something to notice okay so from our end what happens is I have one man constant I'm talking about a liquid I have another constant so I'm multiplying these two constants and obtaining another constant and the reason for this is this rho times g appears too often in the equations, you will see. So instead of saying every single time rho times g, rho times g, I will simply call one letter to save some space, okay? The next concept is called specific, so it's the same first word, but the second is different, gravity, specific gravity, and s dot g, okay? So this is a normalized density, basically, that's how I want to call it. I normalize the density of what I am dealing with with the density of water at 4 degrees C. Okay? So, first question, what is the unit of specific gravity? Well, it's unit unitless, right? I'm dividing density by density, so I'm going to get something non-dimensional. Um, so, what am I, why am I doing this? Maybe a very um, fair question. Well, several reasons. For one, the important thing is that if you're using British gravitational or SI, it doesn't have any units, right? It's the same number. The second thing is that, for instance, let's take mercury. It's 13,600 approximately is the density of mercury. Instead of referring to that as 13,600, the density of water at 4 degrees C is about 999. So what will happen is then the specific gravity will turn out to be right around 13.6, okay, approximately. So my point is, do you prefer to use this all the time? Do you prefer to this all the time? So to me, this seems a little bit easier. So that's one of the motivations we have behind it. Okay, let's go to the next one. And the next one is pressure. Okay, and this is P. So this is force per area. Okay, every student when I ask, they say force per area, force per area. Well, let me ask you a question. Let's say that I have a surface like this, okay? This is my normal, right, from the surface, and this is my F. So is this F over A? Is this F over A is equal to pressure for this particular case? Well, that's not quite right. 
okay? So this definition needs to be, you need to be careful about this because it is the normal force component per area is called the pressure, okay? So in this case, for instance, if this is alpha, so my P will be F times cosine of alpha divided by A in this particular geometry. There are two ways of representing pressure. Right? Two ways, okay? The first, I'll talk about both of them. Let's first start with, uh, by the absolute pressure. So the difference between these two ways of representing is the datum, okay? In the absolute pressure, and I call this PABS, what I do is I set my datum to be zero pressure, okay? And we call this vacuum, right? And the second one is called the gauge pressure. And it's basically P sub G. And my datum in this time around is atmospheric pressure. Okay, so I will explain these two differences in a graph. I think it will be better for all of us. Let's draw the y-axis, okay, and let's call this pressure. And let's have an x-axis here as well, like this, okay. And let's say that this is basically pressure zero over here, okay. Let's have another line over here, and let's say that this is atmospheric. And let's have a line over there as well using SI, 101 kilopascals is what I'm at. And if I'm using British gravitational, then it's gonna be 14.7 PSI. Let's say that I want this particular line to be represented. So I have a few options over here. I can define this from here to here, this distance, or I can define it from here to here. This is called P absolute, this is called P gauge. Okay, so it is the same point, it's still the same orange uh, color that I have the pressure. Okay, and let's put some numbers to here and let's say that this, the, the pressure that I have here, uh, absolute wise, let's say that it is 90, right? This is in my graph that I have on the y axis, this is 90 kilopascals. So then if I go ahead and write my PABS, you will find out that, well, actually that is what 90 kilopascal is, okay? And then it seems very straightforward, and you may be thinking to yourself, why am, I, why am I dealing with PG over here, okay? Is this over here to make my life complicated? On the contrary, no, you'll find out soon, okay? The second is PG. So the PG is defined this way, okay? P absolute minus P ATM. This is the formula that converts from absolute to gauge. And you can see here is my P absolute is 90 in this particular case minus 101.325, right? And if I calculate this, I will get this as minus 11.325 kilopascals. So basically this P gauge and this absolute is exactly the same value. You may ask me, why am I dealing with this? I don't like this too much. It's complicating my life. Well, not necessarily. Let me give you an example. Let's say that, well, you're listening to me in your home, as an example. And let me ask you a question. What's the pressure in your room? And one answer may be, I don't know. The second answer may be, you know what? I don't know. So I'm going to take it atmospheric pressure, right? That's the best I can do. Okay, then let's look at this, this orange line has been moved to here. So these are identical lines. My orange line becomes the blue line as well. And if I'm representing PATM in terms of the absolute way, it's gonna be 101.325 kilopascals. What about the atmospheric pressure in terms of the gauge terminology? What is that value? Well, I gave you a hint. I said that this orange line will be the same as the blue. So the difference between those two will be Zero, right? Okay, so I'll ask you a question. Okay, you, you be the judge. I have a very complicated equation multiplied by pressure. Um, do you really want 
to multiply this whole equation by 101.325, I'm giving an example here, versus 0, any day of the week that ends with a y, I will pick this one. So I can get rid of that particular term. And let me ask you a question as well. Do you think the final answer will be dependent on which one I pick, how I represent my pressure? No, not really, right? Otherwise, this is all arbitrary. There's only a single data point in the reference frame, okay? That my final number will be. We want another question. Can I get a negative pressure? Because that's kind of a tricky concept, negative pressure. You'll find out in these modules that the best answer for me, for everything, is it depends. And this is a perfect place for that as well, okay? The answer is actually depends. If you're using absolute, the answer is no. I'm not going to have a negative, so think about it. I'm not going to go below this because it's already zero, right? And the definition of vacuum is there's no particular mass corresponding to a particular volume given to me. So there's nothing else in happening there. I can't really go further down. How about this? P gauge? Oh, yeah. I gave the example and actually it was negative over here, right? So it is quite feasible to be have a positive and a negative because sometimes I see students get confused. Oh, I got a negative sign. Should I panic? Nope. And the other thing that I want to say is, although we like the SI, Standard International, mini percentage of students, I still want to highlight that we need to know British Gravitational because that's what we use when we go to a, a big box store. You need to communicate in terms of the British Gravitational units, one. Two, there's some advantage of British Gravitational in this. So I mentioned that uh, this is 14.7 PSI, is the atmospheric, right? So they, there's a brilliant difference, PSI and PSIA. These are the two different units in the British Gravitational. This is for gauge. This is for absolute. You can see the additional letter A over here. So that helps to distinguish significantly. SI units, what will happen is when I say, I don't know, plus 10 kilopascals, you have no clue whether that is absolute or gauge unless I specify that to you. Okay? I would like you to realize that.